Report to the Nation from CBS World News, presented by 154 electric light and power companies. Tonight, you'll hear John Laudner of Newsweek, just back from the Italian front. CBS reporter Eric Severide in Naples with an eyewitness account of the new Allied offensive in Italy. Lieutenant General Lim, medical officer of the Chinese Army. CBS correspondent Webley Edwards in Honolulu with a story of a rescue from Truk Lagoon. A new war song. And our reporter, Quentin Reynolds, with a review of history-making men and events in Report to the Nation. This program is brought to you every Wednesday by 154 business-managed electric light and power companies. Now, here is our reporter for CBS World News and Report to the Nation, the noted foreign correspondent, Quentin Reynolds. This week, the big news was the opening of the new Allied offensive in Italy. Six days ago, French, British, and American troops began their big push from Casino to the sea. In the days that followed, they smashed the south end of the Gustav Line. Tonight, they are close to the Adolf Hitler line. Ahead lies Rome. One war reporter who watched the preparations for this offensive in Italy is a quiet young man named John Laudner, who started his writing career covering sports. He turned his typewriter to writing about wars for Newsweek magazine shortly after Pearl Harbor and has since seen Americans fighting in the Pacific and more recently in Italy. He's told Report to the Nation a couple of stories, and before we meet him, we'd like to pass them on. Laudner was one of the first to land at Anzio. He told us... Yes, I was one of the Anzio Mayflower men, and the landing was as close to being a soft touch as anything can be in this war. There was no opposition. The first Germans I saw were two soldiers racing down a road in a jeep, trying to steer, shoot a machine gun, and get their pants on all at the same time. They weren't doing a very good job at any of the three. The next I saw was in a little house. One of the British soldiers had a sad duty to perform. I say, Heine, sorry to wake you up and all that, but you're a blooming prisoner, you know. The Germans reacted to our surprise with customary skill. And soon the boundaries of Anzio Beachhead became quite firm, and not very deep or wide either. In fact, it became as crowded as Times Square on New Year's Eve. The German gunfire and bombing led to many moments that might be called uncomfortable. We also got a look at something else. A German secret weapon. Hey, look at that thing up there. What in places is it? It's like a motorcycle with a purple headlight flying through space. Hey, it's headed for that destroyer. Yeah, but it'll miss her by plenty. Holy smoke! The flame thing made a 60-degree turn and scored a bullseye. Oh, brother, those crowds got something there. And indeed they had. It was a radio-controlled bomb controlled by a plane overhead. But we found two pretty fair answers to the secret weapon. One was to keep the planes out of the sky, and the other was to mess up the frequency the plane used to control the bomb. It's no longer a secret, nor much of a weapon. Laudner was in on the bombing of Casino in the area where the British, American, and French are now operating so successfully. But as you know, that casino business wasn't much fun. In fact, it was pretty fatal. But there was one incident, John told us, that gave many a doughboy a much-needed laugh. It started with a Yankee sentry on duty late at night. Oh! Who's that? Me, Wolfgang Marker. One of the Führer's best grave diggers. Is that you, you Yankee swine? I was looking for you. A bunch of noisy baboons, you Yankees. And your artillery. Stand where you are, chum. Corporal of the guard. Sure, go ahead and call him. I want to talk to him. And to the general, too. Let me tell you something. I had a hard day today digging graves. Very busy. When I got through, my Oberleutnant, a wonderful guy, my Oberleutnant, maybe you know him, comes from Minneapolis. Uh Uh-uh, never heard of it. I'm from St. Paul. Oh. Well, my Oberleutnant, he says, 
Wolfgang, you have worked hard. Very hard, Wolfgang. So here is a bottle of what these Italians call wine. So I drank the wine and I fell asleep. Tired, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm asleep only a few minutes and your Yankee artillery opens up. Very loud, Sergeant. Uh, you are a sergeant, aren't you? But very loud. I couldn't sleep. So I came down here to complain. You Yankees make too much noise. Take me to the general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, chum. Just come this way. Keep your hands up. Come this way and you can get a little sleep. And we'll send a general over in the morning. <laughs> They picked up many a German prisoner who wasn't drunk, too. There used to be a regular road mules took, bringing supplies into the hills. On the way down, there'd often be three or four Germans who wanted to surrender, waiting for free rides. Incidentally, I came back on a ship loaded with German prisoners and enjoyed it immensely. And here he is, John Lardner in person. Welcome to Report to the Nation, John. Thanks, Quentin. I hope those stories we told didn't give anybody the idea that uh, Germans are drunks or half-wits. They're neither, and they're very tough customers. That they are indeed, John. You've covered both theaters of our war. Which do you consider the tougher for the ordinary G.I.? The Pacific, Quentin. A bullet kills you just as dead in either theater, but the heat and wildlife in the Pacific makes living in Italy and Africa look pretty good. Tell us something about those G.I.s you saw so many miles from home. Quentin, I have a great respect for any man or woman who is fighting this war, even censors. But my favorite G.I. is the doughboy, the infantryman. I've heard many a flyer say his job was a snap compared to the foot soldier's task. Those infantrymen are fighting a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week war. Why, on Anzio, their rest camp was right next to a huge artillery emplacement. What we've won in all other wars, infantrymen have won. And even in this gadget-minded war, it's the doughfoot who will go in there and clean out the enemy by hand and in person. During the past few days, CBS correspondent Eric Severide has watched our troops in action on the new offensive in Italy. He has just returned to Allied headquarters at Naples. And for his first-hand account of our men in action, we take you now to Naples, Eric Severide reporting. It is 4.30 here, and the dawn is coming to Naples. It is soft and cool, and even Naples is sweet-smelling in the dawn. Around Casino, where the Germans have been holding, west of Scari, where we advance, the soldiers will be stirring now, their limbs stiff with chill their beards one day dirtier. Their nostrils are black with dirt because our trucks stir the dust by night as well as day. Some smell the perfume of the purple clover and others the odor of gunpowder and the dead. But there are really so few who fight and so many more a few thousand yards, a few miles back. Their camps under the olive trees are clean. There you can sleep a regular sleep. You can have a hot shower. There may be flowers on your table. These men are of the army, too. And yet between them and the men just ahead, there lies a gulf which nothing will ever bridge. It is as wide almost as a gulf between all those here and you at home, who will be, in a sense, forever strangers to your son. I have been very often these last two months among your sons at the front, and now that the fight is on, I realize that in a curious way they are happier now. A week ago, they were fed up. They complained, the soldiers do, about everything. The heat or the cold, the work or the idleness. They just wanted to go home. But yesterday, I walked slowly into the smashed town of Skari in the line of infantry which was to occupy the place. They were very dirty and tired. Yet there was a satisfied look on their faces. Few of them spoke. If you smiled, they grinned back at once. They are rather simple conquerors, your sons... They don't cheer and run up the flag. They seem a bit awkward and embarrassed in the middle of their town. A youngster with fuzz on his chin utters a low whistle before a tank which stands foolishly on its nose. A farm boy with great red hands surveys a perforated resort hotel 
and says, I'll take a room with a southern exposure. Your sons have no real feeling of conquering country. They are just after the Germans, and they have to walk over this particular land to get them. They have no feeling of liberating the people. The Italians are just some harmless folk who get in the way. A few miles up the hill are the victorious French, who do run up flags, who do laugh and talk about their victories. They know why they fight. Your sons have few ideas about making a new world, but they know how to take that next town or hill, and in their workmanlike, competent American way, they go ahead, and the result is the same. The Germans are beaten. I return you now to the report to the nation in New York. Here's Ted Jewett, and I wonder if he's ever noticed in comic strips when somebody gets an idea, the artist draws what looks like an electric light shining above him. Sure, I've noticed that, and it gives me an idea myself. It's this, ladies and gentlemen. Try to think right now how much your last electric bill was. Try to remember exactly, if you can, right down to the odd sense. Made your guess? Now, if I were a betting man, I'd lay you fairly substantial odds that you've guessed too high... For it's a fact that most folks do tend to overestimate the amount of their bill. The truth is, if you're an average family, you're not only paying mighty little for the electricity you use, but on top of that, you're getting more of it for your money than ever before. Yes, to the average user, the price is only about half what it was 15 years ago. If the amount of your bill looks about the same now as it did then, that's because you're using more electricity now and enjoying it more. For most American families have added a good many electric servants in the past 15 years for greater pleasure, convenience, and comfort. And so, electricity is one of the best bargains of all the things you buy. Long-range planning, sound management, and wider use have lowered its price. And this at a time when most other prices have been steadily rising. Now, on with Report to the Nation with Quentin Reynolds. This week, the Chinese army opened its first large-scale offensive in seven years. 20,000 Chinese troops plunged across the Salween River in a final drive to join forces with the Chinese army and American troops under General Stilwell. The news headlines sound simple enough, but the hardships, the struggle, the overwhelming obstacles confronting that offensive can only be guessed. Some of the medical problems alone are all but insurmountable. Report to the nation's next guest is going to tell you some of those problems. He is a man whose work with the Chinese Army has already made medical news in this country. Here he is, Lieutenant General Robert K.S. Lim, Chief of the Supervisory and Planning Commission of the Chinese Army's Medical Service. General Lim, could you give us a rough idea of your medical setup at the Chinese front? It's not at all like yours, Mr. Reynolds. For one thing, our military strategy has had to be entirely different from yours. We haven't had enough arms or ammunition to risk a large-scale offensive until now. So we've had to rely on a defense in depth. Could you tell us a little about that defense in depth? It involves destroying all roads, all bridges, and all railways within front zones 60 to 90 miles deep in order to neutralize the enemy's superiority in mechanized transport, tanks, firepower, and air support. What does that mean for the wounded? It means that they must be carried over difficult terrain by litter bearers. Often a trip from the front to a field hospital takes as long as seven to ten days. In addition to those hardships, you've been very short of doctors, too, haven't you? That was one of our difficult problems, but it's one we have solved the best. The first year of our war, we had only one qualified physician for every 5,000 soldiers. It was then that our medical officers met to discuss plans. They had a good idea based on statistics. We know that so long as we can use our present defensive strategy, our greatest number of casualties will not be wounded men, but men who are diseased. So? Here are the 10 diseases that account for 80% of our casualties. The rest are almost inconsequential in comparison. But we will still need physicians to treat men who are ill with these diseases. In three months, we can train medical aides to prevent these diseases. 
and to recognize the standard obvious symptoms of such diseases. We can also teach them the standard cures. That won't save all our casualties, but it should save a large percentage of them. Are you the doctor? No, I am a medical aide. I was stationed here only yesterday. I have just finished my course at the Emergency and Medical Service Training School. Oh, I had hoped I could find a doctor. But I can help you. You have wrapped yourself up in a blanket. And you have a towel over your head. Why? Tell me how you feel. The other day, I had a bad chill... I thought I wouldn't have to come back to the hospital then. But I felt better later and stayed at the front. I see. Then I had another bad chill. And I ached all over. I kept getting these chills, so I was sent here. That's the story, all right. Orderly, here's another malaria case. Start the quinine doses immediately. That was the way the Chinese army relieved its great shortage of doctors. And how successful was it, Dr. Lim? Mass diagnosis, as we are using it now, is not completely accurate. It is about two-thirds successful. That means that a large percentage can get cured. What about the rest? Many cases of disease are prevented. Those that occur and cannot be mass treated are also helped. By the time our men realize that they have made a mistake they're still able to evacuate the patient to a field hospital where there are doctors. And there, the patient can get the specialized treatment he needs. With this type of assembly line medicine, you seem to have met a difficult challenge very well. That is one of the things we want Americans to understand. This war hasn't been easy for us in any way. There have been obstacles by the thousand everywhere. But with what we've had, we've done our best to help ourselves. We do not forget that America has aided us, and we hope as our offensive rises in intensity in Burma and elsewhere that much more aid will be forthcoming. We have the spirit and the will to fight. Give us the materials to fight on to victory. not win wars, but it helps. In the last war, Ivan Novello's song, Keep the Home Fires Burning, won immortality. For this war, Novello has written the music for another fine song, and the words are by an American army captain. It has an apt title for these times, Clear the Road to Glory. And now, like many another war song, it is played and sung for the first time in this country on Report to the Nation. Clear the road to glory.
One of the first lessons most of us learn is that nobody can have his cake and eat it too. Let's ask Ted Jewett if that fits in with the wartime use of electricity. Well, yes and no. There's enough electric generating capacity in this country for all our war needs and all civilian needs as well. But here's something we can't afford to forget. Electricity depends on other things, on fuel, materials, and transportation. All those are basic war resources. And when we waste electricity, we waste not only those resources, but the manpower required to provide them. Now, seven basic industries are cooperating in a government-sponsored campaign to conserve war resources. These industries are coal, oil, gas, electricity, communications, water, and transportation. And to make the program really work, they must ask your help. So please avoid the wasteful use of electricity. Now, don't cut down at the risk of production, safety, or health, for these things are too important. Just don't use electricity unnecessarily. Now, on with Report to the Nation with Quentin Reynolds. There was no big news out of the Pacific this week, but our Pacific fleet was busy. Our ships were on the prowl for the enemy, and our planes were constantly hitting the Jap wherever and whenever they could. There were attacks, and there were dramatic rescues. Rescues like the story you were about to hear, when, after a brief pause, we take you to Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. Here to help us with the report is Captain Richard H. O'Kane of the submarine Tang. We were on normal patrol off truck when we got word that a torpedo bomber was down near the reef. I established radio contact with the carrier fighters overhead, which guided us to the men, now on a rubber raft. We took them aboard and returned to patrol. Later that day, we searched for another raft, but didn't find it. Then we got word another raft had been sighted around Kuop Island, about 30 miles away. We had to pass the Jap battery at Oland, so decided to open fire first ourselves. This worked fine. There was no return fire at first. Then it was short of us, and we got clear. We didn't find this raft, so we returned again to patrol. This took all of the first day of the attack, then, Captain? That's right. At dawn the next day, our fighter planes indicated another raft, so we closed the reef again. I forgot to mention that, meanwhile, we'd sighted a Jap submarine, but our planes scared him under before we could get to him. We followed the fighter's guidance and found the raft we had been searching for the previous day. With it were pilot and crewmen of a warship float plane that had capsized in the choppy water while bravely attempting a rescue. A second float plane, piloted by Lieutenant J. Burns of Wynwood, Pennsylvania, had come down and picked them up. He taxied the three men to us. Burns then made an expert takeoff. Meanwhile, our quartermaster had seen another plane land with a splash. We headed for him. We had to pass Olin again and shell the battery while our plane strafed and bombed them. We rescued the pilots and crew of the plane and now had nine men aboard. Meanwhile, we found that Lieutenant Burns had been very busy. What about that, uh, Lieutenant Burns? One of our fighters sighted two rafts and another spotted a single man on a raft. I got the single man and then taxied over to the other two rafts containing three men and got them aboard and balanced so as not to capsize. The fighters then directed me to still another raft outside the reef and it took two and a half hours of taxiing to get there. We got three more airmen aboard. You mean you now had nine men on this one small plane? Yes, and it was quite a load. But we finally met the submarine, and they took us all aboard. Lieutenant Burns' plane had been damaged by the rough water, so we had to sink it. His coolness and efficient work had made possible the rescue of 12 men. We had, meanwhile, picked up two fighter pilots, and later, after taking Burns' men on board, we were advised of another raft about dusk. We asked for night fighters, and with star flares, they found the raft with two men, which we picked up after dark. We saw no more rafts, so the Tang resumed normal patrol. The submarine Tang, captained by Lieutenant Commander Richard H. O'Kane, aided by the valuable assistance of Pilot Lieutenant J.A. Burns and others, rescued, under the nose of truck guns, 22 priceless American airmen with none injured. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor. I return you to Quentin Reynolds and report to the nation in New York. This week for Allied civilians, there was wonder. Wonder if this was the week, or if this was the night that Joseph Auslander had in mind. 
when he wrote one of the poems that appears in his book of verse, The Unconquerables. That poem is Invasion Eve. <laughs> This is the hour. This is the night, the sea upon whose perilous and impartial tides the shining shape and strength of destiny with its own image in the dark collides. This is the night. This is the silent hour when the world's burning hope grips hard the helm, when blood and pain and appetite for power our courage at the last shall overwhelm. This is the hour. This is the holy night when from the black throats of 10,000 ships will thunder such an avalanche of light as shall disperse the spirit's long eclipse. This is the night when truth by land, air, sea shall storm the citadel of tyranny. In a moment, Quentin Reynolds will be back to tell you one of the high spots of next week's Report to the Nation. This program is brought to you at this same time each week by 154 of America's business-managed electric light and power companies. There's electric power in this country today for all our war needs and civilian use as well. But don't waste it just because it isn't rationed. Use what you need, but need what you use. Next week, Report to the Nation will observe Maritime Day with an outstanding story of the Merchant Marine. You'll meet Pat Mullen, who has sailed the seas for 27 years and had 17 ships sunk from under him. Also, you'll hear the United States Coast Guard's fine quartet with some unusually interesting songs. And you'll hear more people and stories from the news of the world next Tuesday, Wednesday, in Report to the Nation. Report to the Nation is written by Bill Slocum, Jr. and Margaret Miller. Directed by Earl McGill. The musical director is Victor Bay, and the entire production is under the supervision of Paul White. Tune in every Wednesday to Report to the Nation with Quentin Reynolds. This is CBS Columbia Broadcasting System.